Roger, what's your assessment of how the Prime Minister has been handling this? Uh, very poorly, I think, is, is mine and the general assessment. Uh, I'd like to see a breakdown of the statistics of the 400 people who've been arrested, you know, just what camps they're actually in, because I think there's, as widely reported, a tremendous prejudice, as I say, against your average working class Brit who he's characterizing as a far right thug. And as to immigrants and uh, other people not of original British origin, uh, I think they're they're being uh, quite lenient. Um, he's also starting to make noises uh, that are very threatening about free speech, it seems. Uh, certainly some laws have been passed that affect free speech as it was protected in universities. And I saw something uh, this evening that you can actually be arrested if you pass on a video on the socials uh, that they don't like. That if you if you pass on something that uh, involves what's going on, that can be classed as a crime. They can knock on your door and arrest you, apparently. I don't have the details, but there was some allusion to that. And it's scary. It's very much like in Australia, where uh, Albo uh, made a speech the other day really not dissimilar from Keir Starmer's, and it was followed uh, by, um, I can't remember, one of his uh, uh, colleagues who said, unbelievably, like 1984, now, if you know anybody, you know, among your acquaintances who is talking and expressing extreme views, please call this national security hotline number. I, I mean, it was unbelievable. So. Both places uh, are, 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 it looks like they're cramping down on free speech. Mm, OK, I'll look into those reports that you're referring to. Let's talk about Nigel Farage, because he's had to ramp up his security after being blamed for the violent riots. Here he is. Personally, I have to say I'm pretty disgusted by comments made uh, by people like Andy McDonald from the Labour Party, Anna Subri, former Conservative MP, broadcasters like James O'Brien on LBC, calling these Farage's riots. People saying, actually, I've been orchestrating, organising, encouraging the riots. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. And because of that level of incitement to hatred against me, I've had to have a very significant change in my security situation over the course of the weekend. Roger, it is so concerning. Where do you see this going? I think there's two things involved with uh, Nigel Farage, Gabriella. I mean, first of all, it's very convenient for his political opponents to uh, be able to attack the success that the Reform Party is having with the electorate by, by conflating them with what's going on out in the streets. And because they are opposed to unlimited illegal uh, immigration, uh, uh, claiming that they are the cause of these riots. Mm. Uh, put the two and two together, you know, it's kind of like, like proving that you don't, you know, I, I, you don't beat your partner or, or whatever that old saw is. Um, the, and then of course, the other thing, there are a lot of people that don't like Nigel because he is very, uh, confrontational and controversial. And again, this is a good excuse to attack him for that. But I, I don't think many people can point to much direct evidence of anything that Nigel or Reform has done that have caused these riots, uh, other than to be against, uh, you know, illegal immigration. Uh, but, you know, so are, are most of the people in the streets, it would seem. I want to talk to you about the stock market because stock markets and asset values are crashing around the world. You've written for skynews.com.au about the three entirely different and distinct factors that led to more than $100 billion worth of stock being wiped off the ASX in just a couple of days. What's your summary of what led to this? Yes, well, I mean, it was a kind of a triple witching thing, uh, Gabriella. Three things uh, actually happened. I, uh, uh, the one that really set it off and the biggest was in Japan. Um, there have been a lot of explanations about this containing uh, a lot of economic uh, economists uh, gobbledygook. Let me try to uh, simplify it if, if I can. I mean, basically, uh, the Japanese currency, the yen, 
has been very, very cheap for, for an incredibly long time. You could borrow it for, for next to nothing. Um, in fact, Japanese interest rates were so low that they had negative interest, meaning that if you deposited money in a Japanese bank, you paid them to hold it for you. That's negative interest. So when you borrowed it, the interest rate was 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 minuscule. It was almost nothing. Now, a lot of people, many, 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 many trillions of dollars worth of people or trillions of Aussie dollars or pounds sterling, whatever, borrowed yen in order to buy assets of every kind all over the planet, which is not the greatest investment strategy because you can't really uh, hedge and protect yourself completely. So you're taking the risk, you're borrowing in one currency and you got assets in another currency. And then of course, what happened is called the Japanese yen carry trade. Those trillions and trillions upon trillions of dollars became exposed when Japan recently started to raise its interest rates. And that led to what are uh, known as margin calls, where the bank or the other lender that made you the loan says, hey, Gabriella, uh, you know, we lent you 70% or 50%, like a mortgage, of the value of this thing. But now we're lending more than that because with the extra interest you've got to pay, the overall loan is more expensive. So please give us some cash. Now, what happens when there are margin, margin calls is usually a whole lot of lenders say, well, the hell with this, and they dump the assets and pay off the loan immediately. That's what happened. And there was a giant sell-off, and Japan suffered the worst fall in 37 years. And that reverberated around the world because these assets all over the world. Now, unfortunately, at the same time, people discovered that the central bank in America, the Federal Reserve, or the Fed, had failed to to predict uh, some basic fundamental weaknesses in the U.S. economy around jobs and other things, which meant that the U.S. is likely to go into recession. That scared the you-know-what's out of investors even more, and they started to dump stocks there. Um, that then uh, caused a panic. And then the third thing was that some genius somewhere decided that all the companies that have invested gazillions in artificial intelligence overestimated its value it it doesn't actually think for you yet it's just a data analysis tool and they decided these companies are going to lose huge amounts of money so they started dumping them so those are the three things that happened a huge amount of dumping of assets which of course you know if you've got 10 houses on a street and you sell them all at once the value falls of all of them and that's what's happened here that's what caused the crash i predict it will reverse itself pretty quickly, and, you know, we'll be back in calm waters. Okay. Well, let's talk about the U.S. election. Kamala Harris has selected her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. He's been described as being further to the left than Kamala Harris. What do you make of her choice? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to do that, but, yeah, he is... <laughs> she's doubled down. I mean, it, it's, it's a joke. I mean, I don't know how anybody could vote for Kamala. She was everybody's last choice nobody would endorse her until five minutes ago she has an abysmal track record she doesn't speak very well i'm not sure her thinking process is all that good um uh, you know uh, she's she's nice to look at and, and, and she's funny sometimes and, but you know she's not presidential and she's so left and the things that she've done are so left and so woke and so exactly what america does not need right now and then she goes and doubles down and picks this guy, which strategically is so stupid. Now, had she picked Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, who's very popular and would have probably won her Pennsylvania, which is, you know, kind of sort of the state yeah. on which this election depends. Absolutely. If she had, Pen if she had Pen Pennsylvania, she probably she didn't pick him, they say, because he's Jewish, and the squad, those four ladies, uh, some from Somalia and elsewhere, uh, in Congress, who are very anti-Israel and anti a lot of other things, 
are pretty much running what I call the new the new Democrats these days. And they said, no, 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 Josh, no Jew. And so she picked him. And I, I think she's probably lost the election as a result of picking uh, somebody mm -hmm. so far left with a, a track record of his own, which is probably not even as good as hers, which isn't very good. And at the moment, Kamala Harris is just refusing to give interviews. Meanwhile, Elon Musk is set to interview Donald Trump on Monday. What can we expect from that? Can I, may I just go back and add one thing about Kamala that I forgot to say, which of is course. that I think the reason that Joe Biden is still president until January, which is of all the insane things going on in the world, and there sure are a lot of them at the moment, for him to remain, a man who is not fit to run for public office, to be running the free world for six months from now until January, I think the reason for that is because if he stepped down from the presidency, as well as the candidacy he stepped down from, and Kamala took over, she would probably make a mistake before November, just like picking Walt, that would cost the Democrats the election. That's why they're Possibly. keeping Joe in place. Yeah, Elon Musk. I'm sorry, ask me again, please. Yes, yeah, so what can we expect? Elon Musk had to interview Donald Trump on Monday. It's, a lot of eyes will be on that one. Uh, I think there's a triumvirate of, of, of three, maybe five people that are, are kind of potentially the saviors of all this. I think there's Donald Trump. I think there's Elon Musk, who has to be now even more than Biden, the most powerful human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, Musk could could put any country out of business in five minutes by repurposing his satellites and knocking out all theirs. It's, it's incredible. Uh, so Donald Trump, Elon Musk, Tucker Carlson, and I would add uh, my friend Douglas Murray, I, uh, and also Jordan Peterson, five. I think those people can bring some sense and reason to the world. And I think that's what they're doing. I think the debate between uh, Musk and Trump on Monday will be something very special uh, to watch and probably uh, very exciting and 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 rather exciting and, and inspiring. I think that Elon is getting a lot of flack at the moment because he's taken on the president of Venezuela, hasn't he? And now he's taken on the brand new Prime Minister of Britain and 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 Starmer and the Labour Party don't like that at all, but uh, he's in a position to do so. Uh, uh, he's also pretty right in the things that he's saying, and he's got a tool called X, which is the largest communications tool in the world now. So uh, he's pretty unstoppable. Roger, thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. Great to speak with you. Great to talk to you too.